You are listening to Unscripted Moments, a podcast about propaganda. So, hello from the aftermath of the Buffalo Blizzard of 2022. That was not a fun experience. I was without power for around 40 hours in my house, and things got pretty bleak over here with regards to uh, possible carbon monoxide poisoning, smoke from my fireplace filling my entire house, and having a dead cell phone battery and no way really to contact the outside world. And even if I had been able to contact anybody, emergency services in the entire city and region were not responding to emergency calls. So to say I am thankful to be alive right now talking to you on this podcast is an understatement. So let's get to the episode. On this episode, my guest Michael Whiteside and I are discussing March of the Crabs, track 13 on Today's Empire's Tomorrow's Ashes. And just to kick this off with some information about this track, you can find a full two and a half hour conversation with Chris, Todd, and Jord on Chris's Patreon channel at patreon.com slash Jesus H. Chris. That conversation on Chris's Patreon was released on December 25th, 2020 and goes into a deep examination of Todd joining the band, the story behind Today's Empire's Tomorrow's Ashes, and the perspective behind the story and creation of this tune. The entire backstory told by the people who made the record and this song in the first place is essential listening for all of you propaganda fanatics out there. And... The listener comments section on that episode in Patreon is also really great and worth re-examining. So Chris talks about the history of demoing for Today's Empire's Tomorrow's Ashes, but was unsuccessful in finding a complete demo of what the song sounded like before recording, how the song was sort of an amalgamation of riffs from other songs, and the history of what the members of the band can remember. And then they speculate on the origin of of the dual vocalist approach to March of the Crabs that appears elsewhere around today's Empire's Tomorrow's Ashes. Then, Todd explains the song is all a few meanings sort of twisting into one, which uh, Michael, my guest on this episode, and I will kind of dive into from our perspectives as well. So, Todd talks about the memory he has of a fight during his elementary school years between a few groups of kids in Regina, Saskatchewan, his hometown. And Todd remembers the crowd and recounts his memories about the song. And it's just a great fun of reminiscing between the band, uh, hearing Todd tell the story of March of the Crabs. So the episode is a fun conversation between pals and the actual meaning of the song explained by the band. And they really start diving into the meaning of the song at around 55 minutes into that March the Crabs episode on Patreon. So if you're looking to revisit that episode, I definitely recommend it. I went back and listened to it again recently, and I really enjoyed it. So a fun note as well that I was kind of digging into is that the band Anvil also has an instrumental song called March the Crabs, which is very fun. So if you're looking for another song called March the Crabs, go find Anvil's Instrumental. So let's get into my episode with Michael. So Michael Whiteside uh, contributed an extreme grindcore style of cover of March of the Crabs, and then he joined me for a chat to discuss the song. I didn't know that Michael was uh, trying to submit videos to try out for Propaganda before Sue Lin joined, so that was a fun little discovery during this episode. But Michael is a really interesting and enjoyable conversation partner for this song because he is a music writer and deputy editor at the music website Fecking Bahamas, an online math rock music magazine. And the mission of Fecking Bahamas attempts to connect global math rock communities and provide equal exposure to international math rock bands. So it's really great to hear Michael's thoughts on music journalism, his analysis of this song, the story behind creating his grindcore cover of March the Crabs, and much more. So 
We will kick off this episode with Michael's cover, and then we will jump right into the conversation. Enjoy. Michael Whiteside, welcome to Unscripted Moments, a podcast about propaganda. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. I'm delighted to have you here, Michael. I'm wondering if you can just spend a moment and introduce yourself a little bit to the listeners out there so they know a little bit about who you are. Sure. Yeah. Um, I am Michael Whiteside. I am the editor-in-chief currently of a website you might have heard of called Fecking Bahamas. Uh, We do a lot of coverage for the weirder side of rock, uh, mainly being math rock, 
prog offshoots of indie jazz electronic stuff uh cover a lot of obscure stuff but you know a lot of it is very punk adjacent uh being that math is often described as uh kind of the bastard child of jazz and punk and emo and a few other sub genres depending on who you ask but um yeah our i guess mainly my obsession with propaganda comes from uh that is like really loving technical music um but yeah before we get super into my my being a fan of the band uh, i also play in a band called child speak and a band called muscle beach petting zoo uh muscle beach petting zoo was started after i started uh practicing to try to replace beef when propaganda <laughs> put the call out nice um, cool yeah when i when i was done I think learning failed states and like five other songs, I realized, wow, I'd never practiced so much in my life. And wow. And how much I would need to continue to practice. And uh, luckily, it just caught the attention of a couple people locally. And they were like, do you want to play in a band instead of like, you know, impossibly make a quantum leap like that? Uh, and it ended up working out. Uh, and that was my first experience being in like a really, uh, intense band and yeah i don't know we were our early stuff was definitely propaganda inspired particularly because we had a a drummer that played in a band called manitoba lights uh and not a part of it uh very very sort of central canada punk inspired lots lots of uh lore in there anyway that's that's super cool did you make go through like the video filming process and like submitting the material to them when you were doing that tryout process yeah i think i did coach's corner cool. but that wasn't one that they had asked for and that had already set up this thing in my mind where i was like i don't know why i did that like i should have sent in something that they asked for because i had even practiced those songs but i didn't think i was maybe as polished on uh failed states but failed states was uh much tougher than i thought it was gonna be amazing what are some of so i didn't know that you do a lot of like music writing and specifically within like mathy music that's really cool i'm wondering if you have any you know suggestions out there for what's really exciting you in music right now because i'm always looking oh for new stuff especially because like the podcast the format that we've done here has changed a lot the last like several months and so i'm kind of finding myself re-emerging into being a fan of music like far beyond propaganda for the first time in quite some time um doing a show like this you get so immersed in the minutia that you kind of forget that a lot of other music exists in the world so if you have any oh, yeah. suggestions that stuff that you're really pumped on right now i'd love to hear it um i do actually uh here give me like three seconds here i've sure. been compiling a list of some of the better stuff from this year nice it's been um normally we do a top 25 but this year, there was literally so much stuff that I couldn't uh, keep it to that. We're doing a top 50 this year. Um, nice. So I'm going to try to pick a couple that I think are at least somewhat adjacent to like uh, punk and rock. So like, you know, you're not too far out there, but I'll throw a couple out of left field as well. Um, one I think you might really dig is Fox Lake. Okay. Um, I I don't remember where they're from, but it is it is north of me. It's definitely from Canada somewhere. Um, they are on Coup Sir Coup Records, uh, and Max, who runs that label, knows a couple of the guys in Propagandy. Um, that, so Fox Lake is definitely one very melodic, but throw, they throw in a lot of uh, ra not necessarily random, but it's it's complex for for that kind of stuff. Um, false pockets was another weird one that, that was very surprising for me uh they're from new york uh man they, i hope they're from new york i'm pretty sure they're from new york and uh they that was like an early one in the year but i knew uh like february or march when it came out that was going to be one on my list obviously you probably know a wilhelm scream oh released yeah the record this year yeah it's great um, too i love it yeah it was super cool it was um 
kind of like a mix of what I thought was going to happen. Ultimately, like, you know, yeah, these guys are, go- they have to mellow out at some point. They have to, uh, <laughs> you know, the, um, Zeke, is good. the singer is going to burst a blood vessel. Yeah. Trevor sings a lot now too. Trevor's singing a lot more on this record. Yeah. That's, and I dug that. That was, I wonder if maybe that is related, you know, maybe he's like, dude, you could, you could sing a little more on this one. Save me some trouble. Yeah. Um, but I really enjoyed that because they still kept up the, uh, kind of, uh, their first couple records were very evocative. I'm not sure how to describe it, but that, but party crasher and the, one of the EPs, I was like, this is still really good, but I think that they are tired of shit. Like, you know, I would be really tired. And this sounds like they have taken a sufficient breather and like really coming back with some more meaningful stuff. Yeah, yeah, um, I definitely agree. This one was really fresh to me. I liked it a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and especially with those vocals going back and forth, that was really tight. Um, a little, a more angry one that you might enjoy. Something that you might have heard of already is Chat Pile. Oh, cool. No, I don't know them. Oh Lord. Okay. Um, Chat Pile is not for the faint of heart. Uh, a lot of waves came from them this year because they released an album uh, called God's Country. And it's such a harrowing and poetic Frankenstein take. Like, it's it's really like if Frankenstein met, like, fronted a sort of a post-punk sludge band. Uh, it's really scary. And the lyrics are really intense. Um, but that's that one's i think anyone could check it out once and get something really intense from it very Um, good yeah uh but let me just throw a few more out there i'll try not to like get super into the weeds uh a few more really good ones are god alone they're from ireland uh the pieces of shit okay i really enjoyed them uh yeah like that was uh unexpected i really enjoyed them Uh, and if you're looking for something really mathy Teen Prime came out. They're from Germany. I think they're from Berlin. Teen Prime uh, released something that's really confusing, and I really love it. Uh, and then what's that one I, that I just was? Al, it's so hard to pronounce. Alu, Alu the cheese chat. I'll, I'll get back to you on that one. I literally just did the review, and I now I feel like I'm butchering it. Um, but they are kind of a super group. They have Trevor Dunn from Mr. Bungle in them. Oh, currently. cool. Yeah, I'm just pulling up the article so I don't ruin it. Um, and the guy from a band called Terms. And Terms is part of the band from Yowie, or formerly of Yowie. A very intense math rock band. Uh, that band that I was trying to murder their name was Alu La Chistas. Chatitz, A-H-L-E-U-C-H-A-T-I-S-T-A-S. Nice. They're from North Carolina. No right having such a confusing name. I love it. Well, they probably don't really care a whole heck of a lot about finding, <laughs> uh, you know, a ton of listeners that they're like, you know what? I don't even care. Well, I'm I'm this age now. I've been making music this many years. I'm just going to do whatever I want. And this includes having a crazy unpronounceable name for the new people to try and figure out. That's fair. That's so embarrassing. Thanks, How did guys. you <laughs> did you so have you always kind of been into like pretty wild music like it, all the way back? Because I've been, you know, fairly consistent in my preference for fairly wild music since I can remember, you know. Yes, um, I this this might be a somewhat of a common thread, but I like many people that are just about entering their 30s or in their early 30s. I was struck like a like a truck hitting me in traffic uh by the tony house pro skater soundtracks yeah and the those songs and that attitude and that energy was such a contrast from what was generally allowed uh being that my, my parents were opera singers and very classically trained very classically aware and honestly tried to keep me away from that stuff hmm. uh so when the the gates were broken and i got to hear all that stuff like on my own all the time 
I changed overnight. I was just like, this is what I've been looking for. I feel like I, I, I've always had, um, not necessarily struggled with, but like coming to terms with the fact that I've always had ADHD or something very, I just have so many thoughts all the time. And it's always like trying to reach back into the past and remember what was I just thinking about? And it's really annoying, but punk rock is always on that speed. They're always very in the moment. And it's, it's always a therapeutic experience listening to punk rock for me, uh, both in terms of like getting to uh, experience similar politics and views on the world. And then also just having something that really matches your heartbeat, you know, your, your BPM in life. Yeah. Did you, uh, where, where does propaganda come in? Where does that door open for you with the band? Uh, I was a, a big fat records kid. I was, uh, probably 12 or 13 when my sister got me like two or three new, no FX records. And when I went on the website, I think there was still a listing for, I want to say, it, I don't think it was today's empires. I think it was uh like the let's talk more rock or potential it was it was it was not one that i expected but i didn't check it out i just was aware of the name all of a sudden around 12 or 13 but maybe other people say this too i i got super into prog metal in college and was into protest the hero oh yeah and they they name dropped propaganda so consistently i was like i should probably go back and check them out and one at a time like literally like one year at a time i would become obsessed with their their records retroactively i think when uh failed states was coming out is right about the time that i was like oh shit propaganda is coming out with a new record let's let's catch up what were they doing and i checked out first it was the uh not failed states the the supporting cast record Mm -hmm. that that was uh huge for me and i learned most of those songs on guitar i thought that everything about it was something that i had been looking for in punk rock there's a lot more heart to it, a lot more ethos and commitment to itself to its own narrative um it didn't seem so performative um even though you know it is very literal um there was something about it that was as heartfelt as it was literal and that was that's a hard balance to strike uh and that really attracted to me and then like the next year because i wasn't it took me a while for failed states to sink in so Mm -hmm. the next year i got super into today's empires and all their other stuff you know yeah it's been every year i've kind of had like a different record that i'll obsess over um but yeah, that probably started around 2012 when nice. when that was coming out. That that kind of backwards and forwards nonlinear obsession. <laughs> yeah, I was. Uh, it was a weird experience for me because I knew right away in 2009 that supporting cast was uh, probably an untoppable record for me. Like I knew right away. I was like, mm, this is this is the one for me for sure. And so when failed states came out, I had a hard time letting go of how perfect I thought that supporting cast was. So it took me a long time to be able to fully appreciate failed states for what it was because I was so obsessed with like living in the past. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I mean, they, they sort of do a, um, it's hard to, it's hard to explain. I, I was thinking about this a lot today too, where they, it's not like they repeat themselves, but they'll have, records nowadays like in the last 10 years that reflect i think similar epiphanies and directions from their past um and uh like there are some parallels i think between failed states and less talk more rock where it's just it's even more uncompromising than normal to the point where it doesn't fit the normal narrative of propaganda to a slight degree not in like an upsetting way but i was just like you know there's songs about things i didn't expect Mm -hmm. there are a lot of dramatic left turns that almost seem like they're just kind of in an open experimental stage and you know that does take a while to appreciate and i'm glad that uh listeners do appreciate it because it is an awesome album but they were going through, uh, I think, a, a relatively dark uh, mental headspace. You know, the, the lyrics on that album, the theme of that album, it's it's dark. 
yeah. and so so has the stuff in the past but that you know failed states i think is it's just one of the more literal uh descriptions and uh it shows throughout. yeah well um at the very beginning of this episode folks out there listening heard your cover that you made for this episode so we've got uh march the crabs from potemkin or from potemkin city limits just kidding oh, from man, today's, I wish. <laughs> from today's empire's tomorrow's ashes and you know just in general um today's empire tomorrow's ashes has a lot of uniqueness within the catalog itself um things that are unique to just that record as far as propaganda goes and i'm wondering if you have any thoughts on today's empire's tomorrow's ashes as a whole uh what makes that record special for you and kind of like what's important about that record in your view dude it's uh that's one of those records that I think is <laughs> uh, there's that stupid no effects song where it says it's uh, where he's talking about getting a copy of this record and putting it on the wall next to uh, like <laughs> Battle Tub of Los Thump, Angeles Battle of Los Angeles and honestly I I respect and I feel that lyric so much because um, the the way that this album approaches the narrative in a more um, storytelling manner um that's more consistent is so incredibly effective um and it it's really personal to me because like i when i moved from california to utah in 2005 uh the lyrics were like literally the story of going to high school you know dickhead shit talk i was like yeah. looking around i was like oh my god man, this is uh kind of a a hell of of just white utopia madness uh you know all these it's very religious very tight-knit communities in that respect uh i was coming to them from a very outsider perspective uh you know if not just kind of deviate you know i i did not fit in at all and the that record wasn't something that i found at the time that i wish i did but um when i when i finally did it was very healing you know to look back on this kind of like landmark uh, mental growth spirit, I think for the band and for me to, to feel understood and to feel represented in that way, or at least uh, stimulated was so special. Uh, and it still is every time I listen to it. And I'm out here again, uh, working on a film and it's as relevant as it's ever been, if, if not more. Uh, and yeah, the, the lyrics are, it definitely represents sort of a shift from the again more more of the literal stuff from earlier into the storytelling which i think is a really powerful vehicle for that stuff um and yeah like we've kind of talked about for a second earlier that there's a lot of weird musical spontaneity that's just like boom everywhere Mar the beginning of march of the crabs does like three or four different things before it starts um there's a lot of songs that are like what like a minute long that are yeah. super prog thrashy and are just gone before you know it uh, but they're all effective you know even like on the remaster that came out when they took out all the samples and stuff it actually like it almost improved the record for me but i love both versions right uh, I feel exactly the same. Like I love that this one just gets me straight into the straight into the middle of the action every single on every single song. Now there's no mm. waiting around. Yeah, and I mean the intro to uh, to today's empires that that first song uh, that that first sample is incredible. Like that was, I think when I first put that on, I I couldn't believe that they were choosing to use samples at first. I was like, cause I was used to that happening in a totally different context, like uh, in an ironic sense. Sure. And this was so not that, um, you know, it, it was really, it gets you when, when she says, you know, thousands of people have been killed for singing this song. You're like, how can that be? And like, before the song even starts, you're like on this trip in your head already. So I, yeah. I thought that was really genius of them to do. And the fact that that record, initially shipped with the the fbi documentary and the you know, the one about the black panthers and all that i was i don't know i have so much respect for the band using their uh, their platform as a vehicle for education in that respect 
Nice. So you did March the Crabs, at kind of like a, a grindcore version of it, uh, for lack of a better word. I don't really. Yeah, I know. What do you say? <laughs> exactly. Like it's, it's heavier. Uh, I'm I'm definitely curious about your your process. Um, first of all, like, so why did you choose March of the Crabs? And tell me the story behind creating the cover that you did for the episode. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, originally I wanted to do Without Love. And then like the second that I committed to that, um, that guy released an amazing cover of it in a very similar style that I was thinking of. And it was like, ah, do you just not do it? And then I was looking at the the tracks that no one had done yet. And that one just stood out to me because it, it had been one that would randomly be repeating in my head after I had released the album. And I was like, that song just doesn't get the respect it deserves. Um, but then, you know, that's that's not necessarily true. You know, Chris did that really cool playthrough for the re-release. And that mm-hmm. taught me uh, quite a bit over the last couple of weeks when I was kind of analyzing how I'd approach things either differently or similarly. Uh, Chris does this amazing stuff with the guitar that's like very influenced uh in terms of like the chord structures from prog and metal you know from you know whatever um all the ones that he wears on his sleeve you know i i think that his use of like the inverted chords really taught me a lot over the last few weeks i tend to use more of the, like the classic power chord fifth interval kind of a thing and he uses a lot of like fourths and inverted things that like are chords technically but you know it makes it easier for him to reach for the the, the lead that's happening with a half a second later and i have never really seen anyone do it like he does and then to think of him singing all this shit on top of it is is just incredible so it's, it's inspirational on a technical level. Uh, again, it, it has a lot of t- signature elements of like just Jordy throwing in like five drum fills randomly. And then we're going into a different key. Yeah, I, I love the spontaneity ultimately. So I think that it's just, uh, yeah, it's a great example of Jordy's moves of the, the band's a lot of things that would become like very signature to the band, even if they were ex- experimenting with it on the whole record. Marsh of the Crabs is a very concentrated dose. Mm. What do you think about the uh, ping-ponging vocals on this tune? Because this is one of the best examples that they've ever done where Chris and Todd share it pretty nicely. Mm -hmm. And I love that this record has so much of that. And I'm curious about your thoughts on the back and forths. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, from what I understand at the the time, you know, I think everyone was really uh, keeping that under a microscope, right? Because wasn't this like Todd's first foray into that with the band um that is really special i i don't know if i read this correctly somewhere isn't todd kind of responsible for the narrative of this yeah this is this is a todd song okay um yeah he he writes lyrics and writes vocal lines in such a cathartic way uh very similar to chris like it's a it's a miracle that those two work together um, I love their interplay, um, and this is definitely one of the most uh, effective songs. I guess if you want to get to know, like you know, what's the what is the most what's the highest dynamic that they approach together? This is a great example of something like that. Um, and the, they're like kind of trade off of like shouting versus melodic is interesting on this one too todd's a uh a vocal monster you know even after you know he had to change his style up a little bit i still consider him to be very uh effective at what he does but this is like one of those you know cases of just a a young man thrashing his heart out you know two of them really (laughs) yeah so I, i like the the plot that we've got in the uh in the lyrics here um but actually, before we get into that, tell me the story about you making this song because I forgot oh, to sure. we forgot to go into that. Sure, yeah. Um, I have been really obsessed with heavy music in the background as as much as I love like technical math rock, prog, and all that. Any I love music in general, but I don't really have an outlet for heavy stuff. Um, and it's something that I really grew up 
using to practice. So there, there's a lot kind of just sitting there uh, in terms of mechanics and technicality that I, I wish I could apply, you know, whether it be on drums or guitar. Um, and recently it just kind of came to a head. It's really frustrating being stuck out here in the desert with nothing to do. Uh, you know, my bands and all that are based in Oregon where I would like to go back to as soon as possible. Um, and the, anyway, I have a lot of music that I'm just kind of sitting on and I'm getting better and better, like just programming with stock programs in logic and putting other programs to good use. And I had set up a template recently from a submission to the Cyberpunk 2077 contest uh, for their their soundtrack. Uh, and it's also very kind of grindcore. Uh, there's some more electronic elements in that one. But I had a template uh, from that project. And I had just decided, you know, our, I'm not going to cover Without Love. Let's see if we can just throw... March of the Crabs into an even higher dynamic using this template that I have from the cyberpunk project. Um, and it was really fun because I already had these like uh, aggressive guitars set up, uh, but I used a couple of the guitar chains for my vocals mm -hmm. uh, just to nail a kind of like deaf heaven reverberated gross yes. high end thing. Um, and those are things that I would like to do better. But, you know, a funny part of me covering this song is, you know, I, I tell my spouse, hey, I got to move the speakers around. Um, I'm actually going to, I need to mix some more. And as soon as I make this move, I break my headphone adapter off into my monitors. Oh, boy. Killing, killing my headphones and my monitors in a split second. And I tried for days to uh, take, uh, you, you take a big pen, you unscrew it, and you you put some super glue on it. It's the perfect diameter for the end of the headphone jack, and you just stick it on there. You try to wait as long as you can and pull it out. Pray that it'll stick on there. Mine didn't, so I had to mix this in an entirely different context. So it's a, it's a little less polished than I'd like it to be, but this cover will always remind me of having to adapt very quickly. <laughs> um, <laughs> much like a crab nice how was the vocal process like how did that feel doing sounds that come out of your face that sound like <laughs> the way that they do because this is uh it seems like hard work on this one you know what i would like to say that it is um i have a lot of friends that just make stupid crazy voices all the time and we're not afraid to uh to embarrass ourselves mm -hmm. uh and it really comes from a place of emptying the, for me at least, you know, ex, you got to empty your expectations of expectations. Like people, yes, if people don't have a context for what is happening in that room, they might call the police. Mm. <laughs> no, it doesn't sound, especially if you're not in a professional studio, <laughs> you know, it doesn't, doesn't sound good. Yeah. Um, but there's something very cathartic about approaching that high end. I'm very influenced by uh, bands like, these are not related bands, but, you know, a band like Black Dahlia Murder or Gridlink, uh, both of those vocalists have very unique high ends that I find just really appealing. Yeah. Um, and I like to, uh, mess around with like guttural lower stuff too and i tried to throw some of that into this cover but it never called for it it's such a the, the general frequency of the song pulls upwards there there wasn't a lot of demand for the lows um at least if i if i had sat long enough with it maybe i would have thrown more in it but i wanted to kind of nail down vocally the the same sort of tone of the original but i wanted it to be sort of radioactive i wanted it to be post that you know the era that that record came out in was visceral enough there you know we had all these things happening 
that I think inspired the emotion and the uh, energy of those takes. You know, there was so much crazy shit happening on, or sorry, so much crazy, so much crazy shit happening in the world that it was probably, I wasn't quite aware of it, you know, being a young person, but to be their age at that time must have been really insane. Maybe not too much different than how it feels now in some respects, but um, now some of those aspects are probably toxic and rotted over. There's all of these things that have gotten much worse. And I wanted to reflect that vocally. So I want to kind of throw in this, uh, not necessarily a supernatural, but just like a very over the top. Yeah. Thing. Uh, sometimes I, I often wonder if my neighbors can hear me like cause sometimes I do like these like vocal covers over the top of like the 8-bit songs and stuff like that just as a joke to put like in the end of episodes and I'm always like I wonder if my next door neighbors can hear me because I'm literally standing like my, my computer desk here is like right on the outer wall of my house so it's like my neighbor's house is like 10 feet away and I'm like there's no way they can't hear me at least a little bit sometimes it's you know, I always wonder about that, but got to do what you got to do, you know? Yeah, this is important work. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Um, So this song, the lyrics are really interesting to me because to me, it's got uh three parts, right? We've got this, we stood our ground part. So it's kind of got this like Lord of the Flies opening where it's just like that you're just picturing these like hordes of young people standing face to face like in like a municipal park mm -hmm. or something like facing off like one group's friend insulted somebody on the other group's friend and they said i'm gonna get all my buddies and we're gonna go together and it's like these like groups of sixth graders that like are mad yeah. at each other but they don't really know what to do. So they're like, we're going to meet you. And we're going to fight you. So they get all their group together and they got to go and they got to back each other up. But really no one wants to be there. And they don't really know what they're supposed to do when they get there. But it feels really important when they're getting their group yeah. together to go to the meeting spot. Um, do you have any like thoughts on this on this opening scene where all the kids are together in the first like, uh, you know, about 40 percent of the lyrics here? Yeah, well, I mean, I think the, the Lord of the Flies uh, parallel is is definitely pretty apt. I hadn't thought about it quite like that. I The line, uh, jackknives and socks, no lie, they're going to die. Um, <laughs> that really gets me uh, because that like, that speaks to all, all the stuff you just said, where, where the, the kids do not want to be there, but out of their mouths are coming like these very real threats, these very real these things that have real world consequences. Um, it's, it's, this is so dumb, but like, this reminds me of like a video I saw a few years ago from Vice on the uh, drill phenomenon in London and how aggressive rap was uh, become a, not necessarily a problem, but you know, it's reaching younger and younger age and you know it still has all this uh mature content you could argue and so when you have like a nine-year-old rapping about like i'm gonna rape your sister mm. you know all of a sudden like boop, all those red flags you go off right um it's it can't be that this nine-year-old really feels that way right you know i mean maybe it is true but like all of a sudden you have these high and mature themes coming from kids that aren't ready for that shit. Um, and I think that, again, that jackknives and socks, they're going to die is such a visceral uh, a description of that feeling. You know, you're all heated. Uh, you, you're ready to go, like, like you said. But it's a really scary situation. I've, I think I've only been in a couple situations like rumbles like that. Yeah. Uh, um, but, you know, you hide under the lunch table like a sensible human being. <laughs> yeah. Or get um, spies, I don't know. Yeah, like even if they're small, a small group of people, they are mighty in this scene. You know what I mean? It's really pretty funny. Um, but then it switches, right? To me, the switch happens at who am I fighting a war that I can't win, swelling with things we try to hide. To me, it's like acknowledging it's going from being the child group of like being in this like rumble. And then all of a sudden it's a like flash forward and you're an adult and it's years later 
And the war is like life and the feelings of insignificance and swelling with things we try to hide. Um, it's like you push deep down your insecurities and you're like just trying to take one day at a time. But then there's also this like stuff that comes in here with you never leave anyone behind a harsh return that slaps you in the face. And to me, that's like about trying to keep the others around you going also. It's like you're trying to be a supportive presence in your in other people's lives around you. But mm -hmm. the slap in the face is like regardless if they want you to or not, um, you can't drag other people along forever. And then it kind of like bites you in the butt. But um you know, that that to me, it's like, who can't relate to these lines? Like, I've got a war in the head, fear our lives won't pass as great events. Like, it's worrying that as you get older and older, that your life won't add up to the promise that you were told or that you thought that you could accomplish whenever you were young. And then the we've been crushed beyond oblivion. This is a, a recurring thing for Todd, mm -hmm. too, because like to me, he refers to this like crushing in Negretto on Victory Lap. Oh, like, wow. 15 years later, you know, like the waves swallow you up. The person comes up for air and then they go down forever. I forgot so, about that. Yeah. So to me, there's that this whole entire adulthood section um, is, is a very recurring common thing for Todd. So I, I love the flash forward adult section here in the middle of it after the whole entire rumble scene in the beginning. It's weird because it, it's like a moment of doubt that snowballs. Um, it's like, I think that, that the little evolution, like the, the way those lyrics progress is, uh, I, I think it's pretty intentional. Uh, you know, Todd can sometimes throw some poetic almost haiku ask things at you you know where they're, they're not necessarily a, it's not necessarily a sentence you know right uh more poetic but this this one is very from the heart for sure and yeah i think that uh like you said it, it is kind of like that flash forward of like maybe the kid has just got the thought that he is probably gonna go home and eat dinner you know but <laughs> yeah. when when he has that thought, it's like the crushing guilt that starts to snowball after like, oh God, are we here? Like, why do I keep doing this? Am I gonna keep doing this my whole life? You know, I can see my parents doing this. There's that line, you know, the drinking don't, the boredom don't. You know, it's like, oh shit, that, that guy he gets it. That to me, that's almost like the parent at home waiting for it all to like just keep going. Yeah. Uh, but also himself in the future, you know, not necessarily Todd, but you know, this character. Yeah. Well, and then there's got like the, the, gr the, uh, you know, graves and memorial walls hold my family name, pills and bottles do the same. So it's like this section's like in that adulthood years where, you know, there's this alluding to issues of addiction as well. And like watching the other people around you just struggle so much just to go from day to day and then seeing those same people die. Uh, and then what remains is like their names on this wall. And you're like, man, am I going to be the same? Is this going to happen to me too? And mm -hmm. then you constantly are like doubting that you can like keep yourself together for an entire lifetime as well. Whenever it's like you've seen the other people around you who were like your role models kind of like crashing and burning left and right. It kind of makes you feel doubt that you can actually ever rise above and be beyond that, you know? Yeah. And I mean, that's, it's such a working class feeling, you know, like that's, that's such a, relatable moment uh, especially i think in the last 20 years as uh, i think maybe when this song came out it, the image of bottles and pills might have been slightly different than how how a kid might hear that today um, you know it's it's very literal not that you know prescriptions weren't around but you know prescriptions are so commonplace now uh and you know the idea of uh medicating your mental health through these uh, pharmaceutical companies and uh, and medicating yourself with alcohol and anything else. It's like, that's a very real part of the working class uh, mentality, you know, and it, it's for, for better or for worse. And I think that's just a, an incredible capture of that. Yeah. Um, yeah. To me, the ending of the adult section is, I hope that freedom's coming our way. Like, even if you're, you know, doubting, 
year after year that you're actually doing better with each passing year. It's like clinging to this hope that maybe next year is our year. You know what I mean? Like this always happens this time of year too, where it's like the end of a year is upon us right now. And there's a lot of people out there who are like, man, I really hope 2023 is better than 2022. And I'm just like, and it really, it, it, it it hurts, you know, cause you have to keep hoping in some way, even though um, it's really hard to make actual sustained changes to, to change things in your life that aren't great, you know? Of course. No, yeah. I mean, I think as you become an adult, you know, that I don't think this song had anything to do with new year's resolutions, but I I'm starting to see it's perfect timing. <laughs> uh, Cause yeah, this is, that is kind of like a theme, you know, with your resolutions. A lot of the time you're like, uh, I, I guess I am going to eat ice cream. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I am yeah. going to dig in here a little bit, but um. I, I like the I hope that freedom line I hope that freedom comes our way line because to me it sort of highlights the how do you say this like it's sort of the planned contention between two sides almost like the overlords you know like the way the a, a left someone on the left and someone on the right might be manipulated by the same person I hope that freedom comes our way to me could um refer to like you know more of a meta thing where they're like i hope i don't have to do this at some point yeah i hope i don't have to either slave away or pretend i am angry at this stranger on the street you know um to be free of either of those tensions would be would be dope (laughs) yeah well and then it switches back it goes back to the children right the fight never happened. The crowd petered out. We all dribbled home. Mission accomplished. It's like this, it's this kind of interesting way if you think about like the grand scheme of life, how so much of adulthood is so anticlimactic. Like you grow up and you're like, oh, when I grow up, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna do this. But then you get to adulthood and it's like, this is it. And so it kind of has the same anticlimactic feeling about being an adult as you see in the end of the fight scene that concludes the song. It's really kind of uh, hilarious when you think about it. Like how many times uh, when you were a kid would people build up everything and then it would just end up being like really dull or unexciting at the very end. And how much of that can be said about being a grown up and an adult in the world too, you know? That's that's very true. Yeah. And I mean, that, that last line, mission accomplished, is like, I think that's what, for for me on on a lyrical perspective kept me just hitting to to go back like listen to the song again 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 i was like yeah mission accomplished what do you mean uh and and that's kind of what what made me think that um the victory referred to earlier is again sort of or you know the possibility of being freed from this fight uh is like maybe it is another meta reference to to the powers that be, but so much of this other so much of the song's lyrics are are more literal than that. But you know, I I want to give Todd credit for whatever he he was thinking at the time. You know, he's he's a very smart guy, and I love both of their lyrics so much. And this is one of those songs that uh, I don't know if they both contributed lyrically, but their uh, their delivery that they're the switch off between those two makes the lyrics even more effective. So yeah, it's just one of my favorite songs from those guys. I love it. Well, um, you know, Michael, I'm curious about your, your general takeaway of how and why this band matters to you and what, like what they do, what, and like what they like do for you and how they make you think about the world and inspire you just in general as a person who cares about the world. Yeah. Um, there are very few bands out there that kind of put their money where their mouth is. And uh, I think propaganda has always been a symbol of like what you can do with conviction in music and what you can do with storytelling. Um, those aren't always the same thing. And, you know, you can, you can tell something very nonfiction. You can tell a very, uh, convincing and effective story 
uh, both can accomplish the same thing. You know, they can both give the listener an epiphany. But I think that propaganda has this incredible ability and uh, just this method of cooking up a song that matches the lyrics and when you do that and you have this conviction and this uh this drive underneath you know whether it be the commitment to uh going cruelty free or you know advancing all these progressive politics uh they're all so important and it adds this sort of third degree to the music that that elevates it to the the status i think of bands like rage against the machine or um you know i I'm sure I'll get a lot of shit for saying this, but you know, just just genuine storytellers like Bob Dylan and uh, uh, God, you know, there's a a lot of singer songwriters. I guess you could list at this point, you know, but that's an area I think that a lot of people get truth and uh, inspiration from, and I think that that sort of plateau that that can be reached in that simplicity propaganda can do with punk rock and i prefer to get it through punk rock (laughs) so i'm with you yeah you know i I do love some acoustic stuff i really enjoyed some of those alternative uh takes from the propaganda stuff in the the patreon yeah uh but uh less talk more rock is what was i say (laughs) nice well you know and I would be making a, a a mistake if I didn't also mention that if you want to hear Chris, Jord, and Todd talk about this song specifically, and today's Empire's Tomorrow's Ashes more broadly, Chris made a Patreon episode with those two guys, which is really awesome because you get to hear Jord bust out his like his his memories of all the things that he has like locked up in like his like tour diaries and things like that oh, all of his, all of his calendar books like he busts things out of the shelves that people like us can never know uh what goes into running the band and so jord is like uh he he busts out all of his files on that march the crabs episode they did a patreon and then you hear todd talk a little more specifically about the imagery within the song and the lyrics that he wrote about. So um, that's a pretty special episode as well, because all of them together is just always a good time. So, you know, it's uh, definitely go check out Chris's Patreon at uh, patreon.com slash Jesus H Chris and check out the March of the Crabs episode. They did a video version of it as well. So you can actually watch them talking to each other um, like a talk show. So that's kind of fun as well. So, Michael, uh, I'm super thrilled that you made the cover for March the Crabs and, you know, took the time out of your holiday schedule to hang out with me and chat about it and uh, tell me what you love about this band, about this particular song. And uh, it's just been a real thrill hanging out with you today and getting to chat about propaganda with you. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's been a real pleasure. I, I really enjoy the show. I'm looking forward to hearing it. I'm looking forward to hearing I got a war in my head. If your lives won't pass this great event, I'm better prospects. Lights up ahead. Do you feel it in the air? When they crush me on oblivion. Lost in death. Walk hand in hand. Grips the memorial walls hold.